this stream, this video that we're doing, and it's um, just to let you know for those of you coming on live, I'm also recording this on a camcorder with a little lapel mic. I don't have the lapel mic on me right now because this is sort of um, sort of an experiment that we're doing, sort of by request uh, that uh, people mentioned that they would love to have uh, sort of a book club going here. So I thought uh, it was a fantastic idea. As you know, I've recommended a lot of books in the past. Uh, comics books, book aside, we've done some readings, I've recommended some books and whatnot. So I thought uh, we'd start our little uh, book club going. And uh, what we're going to do, we're just going to discuss the introduction to Skin in the Game by Nicholas Taleb. Okay. And with the introduction, it's not uh, just a couple of pages. Uh, this book has the longest introduction I've ever read of any book, right? It's about a 50 page int introduction for a, you know, a 200, 250 page book, right? Hello, Fascar, how are you doing? Welcome to the stream. Um, so, basically, that's what we're going to do today. I've, uh, it's a fantastic book, really. And we're going to sort of take this apart, what I've read so far. Uh, some of the places, uh, some of the things that I read, I really went down a little bit, uh, went down a rabbit hole a little bit because some of the stuff was new to me. I didn't know. He gets, he gets into philosophy and history and Greek mythology and uh, mathematics and stuff. So we jump around a lot. Hello, Blueberry. How are you doing? doing well man been looking forward to this really been looking forward to this um i from we'll get into it we'll give everyone about 10 minutes to sort of drop in but uh, just just a dedication page of this book got me excited <laughs> right? but we'll get into it okay so this is what we're going to do today gang we're going to talk about uh skin in the game by nicholas talib okay uh nasim nicholas talib Okay, and all I've done so far is just gone through the introduction, first 50 pages or so. Uh, but regarding books, one of the first things that happened to me back in 2008, 2009, when I started uploading math videos was people started asking me about book recommendations. Okay, and two of the first videos I put out after I finished the first series for Language of Mathematics, I put out a couple of videos uh, for the second uh, series of book recommendations that I had, or might have been towards the end of the first series, okay? So I've been talking about books a fair bit, and as you know, you know, I've shown you, shown you some of the books in my library, I've talked about some of the books we've read. We did a how to study video where we brought out uh, a math book, a physics book, Richard Feynman's book. We brought out uh, the, 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 the linear algebra book, and we brought out, uh, I've got a book here. Uh, Chris Hedges' Days of Chris Hedges and Joe Sacco's Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. And I put out a, an hour and a half video or hour and fifteen minute video, just showing you guys uh, sort of a how to video on how to read a textbook, right? And this book, Nassim's book, Skin in the Game, is more along the lines of uh, Chris Hedges' book, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. I've been marking this baby up right like like seriously right i'm making a lot of notes i'm pausing i'm underlining i'm highlighting i'm starring and what i'm end, ending up doing is because some of the terminology here some of the words some of the historical people that he's referencing i'm not familiar with so some of them i am some i'm not uh, some of the math terms i'm even not some of the he uses uh latin a lot some terminology latin and i look those up and go down the rabbit hole right so this book is along the for reading wise the, the way i'm approaching it is along the same lines as chris hedges and joe sacco's days of destruction days of revolt the book reading that we did on how to say just to let you know how i'm approaching this thing right and just uh, last month i guess a couple of streams ago or a few streams ago uh, last couple of months, someone mentioned that it'd be great if we start up a book club, book reading club, where I could share information on 
what I'm reading and give you my reviews and stuff. And we're, you know, I'm jumping around a fair bit. I'm reading graphic novels, obviously, comic books. I'm reading stuff that's related to politics, economics, uh, geopolitics, business, finance, um, and all that jazz because I believe we're in a serious transition period and there's a lot of disruptive innovation coming, so I want to be informed on that, right? And I'm also reading a lot of, not a lot, as much as I can, distributing it out between all these genres, right? Uh, science fiction and fantasy as well, right? As you know, uh, I mentioned that it was, I just finished, uh, actually, I meant, I gave you guys a review of uh, a Rift War Saga by uh, Feist, right? And we did a reading of the Rift War Saga in a couple of, videos ago on YouTube that we loaded up of uh, their time travel, how they time travel and stuff like this. And another thing I'm going to do with Feist's work, uh, the work War Saga, I've already started it up, but we're going to do a little ASMR math video related to their time travel and, tr you know, try to take that and uh, overlay it on um, sort of an exponential function, right? Just not really analyze it too deeply, but just talk about how exponential functions relate to that little passage that we ended up reading, okay? So before we get into this, because this is officially going to be our book club, first book club reading discussion, right? Uh, what I've ended up doing, I've created a playlist. Uh, let me provide the link to the playlist okay that's a playlist on YouTube I haven't started creating playlist on BitChute yet okay so that's a playlist on YouTube and I believe that contains right now all the videos we've done regarding books okay may they be book recommendations me showing you guys putting up this bookshelf and loading it up with my math books and whatnot showing you guys my math book collection the how to read a textbook video and and other things, a couple of other readings we've done. We've done readings of Krishnamurti's Education and Significance of Life. We've done reading of Raymond Feist's Rift War Saga, right? And we did a reading of War is a Racket by General Smedley Butler, right? So this video is going to belong in that playlist as well. Aside from that, there should be plenty of time for anyone that wants to be here for uh, Nassim's book, Skin in the Game. This is what we're going to talk about a little bit right now. I want to read you some of the stuff that I've highlighted. Okay. As for, let me give you the link to Nassim's website. Okay. If you're curious to find out who this is, and I'm going to read you the description of this uh, on Nassim's website. Okay. So, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb's homepage, right? About the author. Uh, so, I'll quote, okay. Uh, about, author of an in, inserto, okay. An inserto is, uh, I believe it's Latin or it might be Greek. I believe it might be Greek. And it's basically uncertainty, right? So, inserto means uncertainty. And this is sort of a, a series of books that he's creating regarding uncertainty, but I'm just going to read it and I'll explain things to you. And it's, it encompasses many things, right? So quote, sorry if I keep on interrupting my quotes, but quote about author of Inserto, a philosophical and practical essay on, uncert on uncertainty, skin in the game, anti-fragile, the black swan, fooled by randomness, and the bed of procrustus, cr pro Okay, and I had to look that up, what that was, right? But we won't get into that. Uh, back to the quote. Uh, so far, five volume. And what Nassim has done right now, he's quoting someone else that has written a review of the book from Amazon. Okay, so Nassim's tendency is he doesn't like book reviewers. I don't, don't blame him. I don't like movie reviewers to a certain degree. I read reviews of... Uh, unknown people, people who have seen the movies. I don't pay any attention to anyone that's writing a movie review 
or a book review really in newspapers because they're usually paid off or not usually paid off I don't want to trash talk anyone that's for legit but I go to websites where they do movie rankings and I read reviews of you know IMDb people's personal reviews of the books or of movies or books okay so he's quoting someone else right now uh, a five volume investigation of opacity luck uncertainty probability human error risk and decision making when we don't understand the world expressed in the form of a personal essay with autobiographical sections stories parables and philosophical historical and scientific discussions in no uh, non overlapping volumes that can be assessed in any order okay and this book right here is the fifth book in this philosophical discussion of uncertainty which encompasses many other things right and i haven't read the previous four volumes okay the previous four books i have read excerpts from them i have watched lectures of at least two of the books okay and i've watched other interviews and lectures and i've read some other stuff by uh Nassim Nicholas Taleb okay so that's his website you can find additional information about him okay and here's a little uh, penguin random house if you want uh, it's basically you know a little summary of each book I haven't read read them I read I think one of them just to see what the summary was uh, <laughs> Oh man, I didn't realize I do so many of those. Uh, okay. So that's where we are. That's where I'm coming from when in, in regards to this book. Okay. And for me, I'm not sure if any of you guys have read this book. Okay. Uh, I believe we read in a previous video, I read the description, you know, who uh, Nassim is and whatnot. But basically, what got like the first thing that got me excited about this book was the dedication that Nassim has done for the book right and this is the dedication and this is the notes that I took it's not it's sort of copied down uh, because I didn't want to track down the Twitter info that Nassim had given regarding this dedication right but basically the de dedication is this uh, he's dedicated the, the book to two men of courage the first one is Ron Paul, and he calls him a Roman among Greeks. Okay, and I had to look that up, and I'm gonna explain to you what Roman among Greeks is. Okay, and the other person that he's dedicated this to is Ralph Nader, and he reference he he calls him a Greco Phoenician saint, right? And I I don't know what Gecko Ron Paul, and I don't know what gecko finishing is i tried looking it up and i couldn't make heads or tails out of it so i'm going to look this up more later okay but for those of you who don't know who ralph nader is ralph nader is one of the most important people uh you know i don't want to build it up too much but he is one of the most important people on this planet that has taken some action that has benefited humanity more than top of my head I've been trying to think about this for <laughs> for for all of today I'm trying to think about if there's anyone else that has benefited has got some things rolling right decided to do certain things that has benefited humanity more and i haven't been able to think of anyone if you can please let me know if you don't know who ralph nader is ralph nader basically is a person that really uh, instigated consumer protection right took corporations governments to court help bring about legislation that has prevented i don't know how many millions tens of millions of 
deaths, injuries, and has held, you know, has changed the law to hold corporations accountable for their crimes or for their transgressions. And this was basically brought about in the United States, and the model has been has rolled out in many other countries as well, right? Uh, I don't know if Ralph Nader was following the footsteps of someone else. I'm pretty sure he was, but I don't know that person. And in regards to Ralph Nader, and again, uh, one thing I'll mention, I agree with much of, a lot of what uh, Nassim Taleb, that I've read from him so far, and I've watched his lectures and stuff like this, but I don't agree with everything he says, right? And just on that note, regarding Ralph Nader, I know Nassim looks very uh, fondly of um, Nader, right? I've seen it in his lectures and stuff like this, but I found a little foot footnote, right? Because some of the things that Nassim was saying are uh, contradict some of the things Nader stands for. However, Nader is authentic genuine so is Nassim so I'm pretty sure they have full respect for each other as I was gladly gladly found out that uh, he dedicated the book to him as well along with Ron Paul uh, just fast car impressive for a man who got only 2% in the 2000 presidential elections hello buddy hello tragedy how are you doing yeah and that's the kicker right if people knew in the United States who Ralph Nader was and what he has done for the citizens of the United States, forget about what he's done globally, for citizens of the United States, they would grab every president for the last three decades and throw them in the trash, right? Relative to what he has, uh, you know, done for citizens of the United States, okay? Your voice is so relaxing. New family is so much awesome. I'm glad to have you, Joker. Seven Joker. Okay. Here's what Nassim has to say regarding Ralph Nader. Okay. And I'm going to read uh, just a paragraph up here, and then I'm going to read the footnote. Right. And uh, he's referring to common law, and he was getting into common law and stuff like this. And just to let you know, the first. 50 pages of this, 47 pages of this, are basically introduction to this book, Skin in the Game. And they basically sort of recap some of the information, main information from the previous four books. Okay. But here's what he has to say. Um, oh, cool. Adolf. I'm pretty sure Greco Felicianin means uh, from both uh, Greece and Phoenicia. Phoenicia, Phoenicia. I need to look up Greco. Is that what it means? So Greco, Phoenicia. Uh, oops, what did they say? Uh, saint, right? And Saint. Uh, you can get more regarding Saint. And I'll actually I'll show you a table after we read this little paragraph. Thank you very much, Adolf. Uh, I gotta look up what. Hold on a second. We're gonna look this up while we're at it. That way I'm filling up my own gaps at the same time. Phoenicia was a uh, Thalosocratic ancient Semitic civilization that originated in Eastern Mediterranean. Oh, that's because Ralph Nader, I believe he's Lebanese. Nader, let me see what... Uh, Ralph Nader, let's see what his origin is. Thank you very much for that, Alf. I think this is... Uh, da -da 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 uh, born... Connecticut is he or Nassim is Lebanese no so is uh, here we go here's Ralph Nader uh, just I don't uh, I use wiki but I use wiki for the most general basic stuff I don't use Wikipedia for too much politics economics uh, history of uh, or crimes of leaders of powerful governments and stuff like this because uh, Wikipedia is filtered, censored propaganda if you're going non-technical, non-mathematics based, right? So math, Wikipedia is good. Basic general info of the origin of certain people and stuff is good. Some stuff for comic books is good. Some stuff is horrendous. Right? There's contradictions and stuff like this. Just letting you know, right? So take everything from Wikipedia with a grain of salt. But here's Ralph Nader, early life and education. Ralph Nader was born in Winstead, Connecticut 
to Nathra and Rosa Nader, both of whom were immigrants from Lebanon. Okay, so that could be the Greco uh, Phoenician, so the Semitic race from that area. Today was Carl Sagan. Today was Carl Sagan's birthday. I didn't know that, man. Awesome. Happy birthday, Carl Sagan. One of the greatest human beings that ever lived. Thanks, Miles. Devatrus, you mate. I'm here for the insane banter. Awesome. You're gonna get some crazy banter, brother. Uh, not just from me, but from <laughs> that scene. Serious crazy banter here. Awesome banter. What are your opinions on uh, anime thighs? Anime thighs. The question of everyone's mind. <laughs> the question of everyone's mind. What's your uh, Shrek reboot? Oh, animation, we'll have to talk later, brother. Uh, bring it up during a comic book stream, and we'll talk about animation, okay? So, let me read you this, okay? Uh, if a big quote, I'm going to read the, uh, the two paragraphs leading up to Nader's footnote, right? If a big corporation polluters, uh, if a big corporation pollutes your neighborhood, you can get together with your neighbor and sue the hell out of it. Some greedy lawyer will have the proper uh, paperwork ready. The enemies of the corporations will be glad to help, and the potential costs of settlement would be enough of a deterrent for the corporation to behave, right? And this is sort of common law, I believe it's tort law or whatever it is, but common law were punitive damages and stuff like this, right? Uh, this doesn't mean one should never regulate at all, okay? Some semantic, uh, systemic um, effects may require regulation, say hidden tail risks of environmental ruin that show up too late. If you can't effectively sue, regulate, right? And Nassim is not pro-regulation at all, right? Uh, Ralph Nader prefers more regulation than Nassim, and at the end of that sentence, right, if you can't effectively sue, regulate. And he's got a little asterisk on there. He's taking us to a footnote, right? So I'm going to read the footnote to you. The Ralph Nader to whom I dedicate this book is the Ralph Nader who helped establish the legal mechanism to protect consumers and citizens from pred predator, predators. Less so the Ralph Nader who occasionally makes some <laughs> calls to regulate right so it's fantastic seeing two people who disagree on one issue complementing each other and dedicating each other a tremendous amount of time and energy put in there right so that's the dedication to ralph nader oh yeah and when he refers to him so now thanks to adolf's uh mentioning what it means greco greco boop, boop, greco phoenician saint Okay, so Greek, Greco meaning Greek, Phoenician meaning people of that region. So Ralph Nader is from Lebanon, Lebanese, Greek Lebanese background, sort of a Greek thought as well. I'll expand on that. And the saint part will connect up to this, which is on page, by the way, if you have this book, uh, the footnote I was reading was on page 32, right? And now I'm going to go to the appendix on page 47 and that's uh it's a table that he has okay this table that he has here and uh basically asymmetries in life and things and he's got three columns here asymmetries in uh, society uh where we left off in anti-fragile and anti-fragile is a previous book that he wrote right so basically he's broken this up into three columns right this column here the leftmost column is people that don't have skin in the game so he titles it no skin in the game the center column is skin in the game and the rightmost column is skin in the game of others or soul in the game right so this book is mainly about skin in the game but he also talks about soul in the game when you put everything on the line right and his definition of this is this no skin in the game. I'm going to give you some examples, right? Uh, no skin in the game. Keeps upside, transfers downside to others. Owns a hidden option at 
someone else's expense. So just to let you know who are some of the people he lists as having no skin in the game. That means they're not accountable to anything. They risk everything without paying the consequences. And we'll get into that a little bit, okay? But since we're talking about Ralph Nader, I wanna show you where Ralph Nader belongs on his scale system that he's established right now, where he calls him a saint, right? So people, corporations, or entities with no skin in the game. Uh, bureaucrats, policy, policy wonks, right? Consultants, uh, su Sufiates, large corporations with access to the state, corporate executives with suits, scientists who play the system, theologians and centralized governments, uh, journalists who analyze and predict, uh, politicians, bankers. So, and these are some examples of people who don't have skin in the game, right? Here are people who have skin in the game. Uh, citizens, merchants, businessmen, artisans, entrepreneurs, laboratory and field experimenters, uh, government of city-states. So when you go federal government, centralized government, huge, no skin in the game. Local communities, you know, if you want to call them governments, but they're more on a local level, they're more sort of people getting together, deciding to govern themselves, right? So sent localized governments, writers, speculators have skin in the game, right? Uh, activists, hedge fund traders, he says they have skin in the game. And skin in the game of others or souls in the game, okay? And the first thing he mentions is saints, knights, warriors, soldiers, right? And these are people who have soul in the game. They have the skin of other people in the game, right? Or skin in the game for others, of others, right? So that's where he fits Ralph Nader. And, you know, he has a few people he's listed here, you know, prophets, mavericks, munis munis municipal governments, real writers, real journalists, right? Uh, who take risks to expose themselves to get to the truth and whatnot. Okay, entrepreneurs, uh, dissidents, revolutionaries, okay, highest, even only war and death for, so, and one thing he, uh, he mentions here, right, uh, regarding uh, people with no skin in the game and regarding people with skin in the game, right? People with skin in the game, he left blank, because that really depends on what it is they consider to be skin in the game. People with no skin in the game. This is what he's written in the last row, right? As their reward. Seeks, seeks awards, prizes, honors, ceremonies, medals, tea with the Queen of England, membership in academia, handshake with Obama, right? These are people who have no skin in the game. The people who have skin in the game of others or soul in the game, one of them being Ralph Nader that he mentions as being a saint, okay? The highest reward, right? The highest, even only award, is death for one's ideas or positions. Socrates, Jesus, St. Catherine, uh, Hypatia, Joan of Arc, and he called Ralph Nader a saint, and Ralph Nader would belong in that column, okay? I know, we haven't even gone past the dedication page. <laughs> got to love it, got to love it. Okay, as far as Ron Paul goes, what he called Ron Paul was a Roman among Greeks, right? And I didn't understand what he was referring to. I thought about it. I, I know a little, you know, a little bit of my Roman history, a little bit of my Greek history. And all that jazz and I couldn't figure out what in the world this meant right so I did a little looking up and I found uh, Twitter uh, posts tweets Nassim had done okay so I'm just gonna read Nassim's tweets a couple of tweets that he did right the real difference in politics isn't the right versus left 
graduation, but rather Greek versus Roman, right? And this is what he says Greek is, what Greek means. Greek equals puts theory above practice. Roman equals puts practice above theory, right? So Greek puts theory above practice. Roman puts practice above theory. So when he goes along and calls Roman among Greeks, he's saying that Ron Paul is putting practice above theory, where a lot of these bureaucrats and politicians and uh, lobbyists and all these, well, lobbyists, I'm pretty sure they know what the game is about, right? But these politicians and these people in centralized power, they're Greeks, they're academics, they're theories, right? Ron Paul is saying what's working in practice, right? And he continues on, he mentions a couple more things. Uh, the Romans judged their political system by asking not whether it made sense, but whether it worked, right? And this one, he's uh, the clear-minded Tom Holland. He was quoting Tom Holland, right? And I looked up who Tom Holland was, but we leave that alone, right? Which is why I am, and then he continues Nassim, which is why I am calling Ron Paul a Roman among Greeks, a pun on the dedication of the black swan to uh, Benot Mandelbot, right? So he did, I guess, I don't have black swan, but I guess he did a dedication to Mandelbot, the person who came up with fractals in mathematics, right? Fantastic, right? Which is a pun on uh, the dedication he made in black swan for Mandelbot, calling, I'm assuming, he called Mandelbot a Greek among Romans, right? <laughs> which is super cool, which is super cool. Okay. So that's the dedication page. That's where Nassim is coming from. Okay. Greetings, Dr. P. How are you doing? I have the chat open here. So if there's any additional information you guys have, or if you've read this, if you've got any additional commentary, please let me know. Uh, I'll definitely, like, for example, Adolf just explained to us what the dedication of. Uh, nader really meant which is where he came from and we connected up with what he wrote in the footnotes and the table that he created regarding saints right what's what his definition of saint is okay now as for this book now if you've seen the video i put out with uh, let me find it again where i put out where I put out an hour and a, I, I, it's an hour and 20 minutes of how to read a textbook, right? And I shortened that up into a 20 minute video as well because I wanted to load that up into uh, uh, the language of mathematics series as well, right? On 420 Math and Math and Real Life website. But I'm gonna send, give you the link here to uh, the, the video, the long cut, okay? Now, if you recall, in this video, if you've seen this video, okay, I mentioned that for me, the two of the most important parts of the book, hands down, the two most important parts of any book you pick up is the table of contents and the index, okay? And I'm very happy to say, very happy to say that the table of contents for this book is <laughs> we had a top view actually right? is nice and long right he's breaking it down sub categories sub folders basically right so he's got how many pages one two three four five six seven pages of table of contents and the first 40 pages is basically what we end up reading is the introduction which is broken down into three books right book one which is untwist whacked right apologies about the pronunciations part two is is uh, basically the introduction is the prologue right um, so part one of the prologue is untwist whacked 
Part two of the prologue is a brief tour of cemetery. Okay. And part three of the prologue is the ribs of Incerto, which is his whole philosophical discussion on uncertainty. All right. And that takes us to page 47. And the index for this thing, I really haven't used the index yet, but it's a nice index. Right? It's a great index. Take a look at this. He's referencing a lot of stuff. He's got direct, directly going to where he's discussing some of the issues, some of the key points. So I'm pretty sure after I finish reading this book, like look at this thing, so much, so much index. I love a good index. You gotta love a good index. So glad I catch this stream again, especially in a enlightened mindset. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, it's uh this thing if you're in an enlightened mindset uh, you might get lost in a page and then go down rabbit holes right and just to let you know if we don't uh, we'll take a look at some of the stuff some of the things I've highlighted uh, but this thing jumps around a fair bit and he presents a lot of ideas and each one is you know it's fantastic right so I'm just gonna read you some either sentences paragraphs or quotes and stuff like this and if you want to if you feel like discussing this further we can discuss it further or if I if you think I have the wrong take on it please let me know right as Nassim has mentioned here um, let me see if I can find it da, 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 da. let me find this okay because this is related to what da, 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 da. reading 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 I swear I highlighted it so I could read it to you guys uh, real estate right. but basically in this book he also mentions that you if you're looking to seek information if you're looking to uh, love uh, not love I'm reading a thing I love a good index too I love a good index too index mentions for sure for sure uh, one of the things he mentions in this book where I was trying to find you read it uh, right uh, read it to you but i'll paraphrase he mentions that if you're in the process of educating yourself right you learn more if you reread a good book right than reading two books right because in the second read you're going to pick up a lot more from that book and this is one of those books now for me i'm a slow reader that's why uh, I've read some books over again, and maybe a couple of books over again, but it's rare for me to read a book over again because it takes me so much time. That's why I tend to mark up and write up, write in books a lot, okay? So that said, let me read you just a second paragraph on page three. It's the first page of the prologue, book one, the introduction, right? And what is what is he calling this? Da, 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 da. The less obvious aspects of skin in the game, right? Okay, skin in the game, and he's, this is what Nassim is saying. What the book is about, right? Skin in the game is about four topics in one: a, uncertainty and the reliability of knowledge. Okay, both practical and scientific, assuming there is a difference. Or in less polite words, bullshit detection. Okay. And he doesn't like writing out shit. He stars it. So bull asterisk 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 T with bullshit detection. Right? And um, oh where are we? Uh, B symmetry in human affairs, that is fairness, justice, responsibility, and reci reciprocity. Okay. C information sharing in transactions okay and d rationality in complex systems and in the real world that these four cannot be uh, disentangled is something that is obvious when one has skin in the game okay and for skin in the game he has a little as you know 
apostrophe the star and he takes those to the footnotes so i'm going to read the footnotes because this is very much related to ethics as well okay so for skin in the game he had a little note referencing to the footnote quote to figure out why ethics moral obligations and skills cannot be easily separable in real life consider the following when you tell someone in a position of responsibility say your bookkeeper i trust you do you mean that one you trust his ethics he will not divert money to panama two you trust his accounting a precision or three both the entire point of the book is that in the real world it is hard to dis disentangle ethics on one hand from knowledge and competence on the other okay which really relates back to some of the discussion that we've had on ethics but this is really taking a discussion in a from a different avenue different perspective which is fantastic right and he Ethics comes up a fair bit, even in the introduction of this, right? Uh, so I'm going to reference this for ethics. I might be rereading some of the stuff regarding ethics. I've been highlighting the ethics. And whenever, sometimes what I do is flip through a book. And when I'm searching for a word, I look up, I scan for that word, and then I read what I've highlighted regarding that topic. Right? Okay. So skin in the game is basically symmetry for Nassim. And um, the last, the, the last, so I'm just gonna read some sentences, some paragraphs, okay? Uh, the less obvious aspects of skin in the game, that's the title, uh, subtitle, right? Quote, a more correct, though more awkward title of the book would have been the less obvious and italics, so quotation marks, right? The less obvious aspects of skin in the game, those hidden asymmetries and their consequences. Okay. So it's basically, I like the this title better. Simpler. Right. Uh, and then, but to this author, skin in the game, and this is page uh, six right now, top paragraph sentence really. But to this author, to himself, quote, skin in the game is mostly about justice, honor, and sacrifice. Things that are, uh, things that are uh, existential for humans. Okay. And for me, I, for myself, I just put risk sharing as a definition of that, right? So, quote, but to this author, skin in the game is mostly about justice, honor, and sacrifice, things that are that are existential for humans. And for me, that means risk sharing. And this I liked. I didn't know. This was... Uh, let me read you this. And we're in part one right now. Untwist Whacked Prologue. Okay page seven okay uh, the abrasion of your skin guide uh, your skin guide your learning and discovery right so when you cut yourself you hurt yourself physically physically you're growing up you learn you grow touch fire you get burnt you don't touch fire again right a mechanism of organic signaling the abrasion, so I'll quote again instead of interrupting his sentences, right? So, quote, the abrasion of your skin guide your learning and discovery, a mechanism of organic signaling, what the Greek called path, pathimata mathimata, right? And, quote, what that word, what that phrase means in English is guide your learning through pain. Right. If you want to, for me, if I think about that, is uh, you learn more from your mistakes than you do from things you've done right in your life, especially if you're doing business. If you make a mistake in business uh, that you're doing, uh, one silly mistake might destroy the company. 
uh, might destroy your project. You could do many right things and the project might not grow exponentially or grow at the pace you want it to grow, right? And then one couple of good things you do right starts growing and you see the fruits of your labor, right? But if you do one wrong thing, you might kill it in one shot, right? Guide your learning through pain. In Greek, pathimata, mathimata. I like it because it's got math in it. <laughs> uh, let me read you something that is written about, and this is, you know, that was page seven, eight. This is page nine. And now he's gone into war and interventionist, right? Uh, intervening in other countries' business. And he's, he talks about Libya here a fair bit. And for anyone that's been following politics, geopolitics and stuff like this, uh, history would look upon the day that the Western powers destroyed Libya as one of the greatest catastrophes in human history, in our civilization. That's my take, right? Uh, unbelievable. And it'll look upon us the citizens of the West that allowed our governments to do this as some of the most selfish, ignorant, uncaring, un unempathetic people in history, really, right? And Nassim understands this. He doesn't go too deep into it, uh, but he does just bring up that, I believe he either brought it up here or he brought it up during lectures that I've seen where you know, he mentions that there's open slave markets, markets in Libya right now as compared to what Libya was before the Western governments bombed it, which was Libya was the country with the highest standard of living in Africa. Country with the highest standard of living, living in Africa in five years, six years, destroyed by Western powers to have open slave markets. Wow, right? And this is what Nassim has to say regarding this mindset right and i'm going to read uh you know just a couple paragraphs maybe three paragraphs two and a half paragraphs from page nine okay and he's just gone into talking about interventionalist those people who went who told us they went to libya to get rid of a dictator or whatever it is any thoughts or tips on staying calm and confined in an audition or interview type situation uh, own your audition I guess I've never done well maybe I have I've done interviews um, I've done for sure job interviews and stuff like this uh, go go in there with confidence do your homework you have to do your homework hopefully it's not your first interview and if it is uh, just be calm realize that wherever you're interviewing for whoever you're auditioning for is looking for the best person for what they have in mind so really pay attention to what they're asking you right really pay attention to what they want don't automatically try to interpret what they want really rapidly into what you think uh, that means right because the odds are they've thought about that for a long time and they've already covered some of the angles that you might instinctively start thinking about right so just listen to what they're asking you look at their body posture try to figure out if that's a really important question that they're asking you it's not like you know do you like to drink coffee or tea or stuff like this that might be important to them but more of the intricate question and before you speak pause chew your words and then reply um, okay maybe maybe let me read you two and a half paragraphs and don't give up on logic intellect and education because tight but higher order logical reasoning would show that unless one finds some way to reject all empirical evidence advocating regime changes implies also advocating slavery or uh, 
advocating slavery or some similar degradation of the country, since these have been typical outcomes. So the intervention, inter, interventionalistas not only lack practical sense and never learn from history, but they even fail at pure reasoning, which they drown in elaborate semi semi abstract buzzword buzz word laden discourse there are three flaws one they think in statistics not dynamics two they think in low not high not high dimensions three they think in terms of action never interaction okay we will see in more depth throughout the book this uh, uh, defect of mental reasoning by educated or rather semi-educated fools i i can flesh out the three uh defects for now right and then he goes into detail talking about what the three defects of interventionists are when they go and wage war on behalf of whatever it is that they are doing right you're welcome intrepid you're welcome intrepid. okay <laughs> got something major highlighting here so let me read you this right the principle of intervention like that of healers is so do uh, is first do no harm prima non nuncri i guess that's latin or greek I don't know, right like the healer so the principle of intervention like that of the that of healers is first do no harm even more we will argue those who don't take risks should never be involved in decisions in making decisions right and one of the things uh Nassim has mentioned continuously mentions this politicians right now have no skin in the game they go wage war without paying the price for it right there are numerous leaders in the western world who have committed war crimes wars of aggression lied blatantly lied. all of that has come out and what happened in 2008 with obama coming to power he turned around and turned to the world and said war crimes have been committed but let's move on and forget about the war crimes that were committed okay it's no it's no use going and dealing with all these difficult choices that the people that came into power before him or were into power or the heads the talking heads that were making waging war right it's no use prosecuting them for war crimes right that's what one of the major things that the obama administration did so they uh they normalized war crimes right crimes against humanity which is one of the reasons we're seeing everything that's happening right now right those who don't take risk and i highlighted this those who don't take risks have skin in the game should never be involved in making decisions that's fantastic which is one of the reasons nassim believes in uh, the draft when a nation goes to war uh, the draft must be in play because everyone has equal chance of going to war it's not just those who have no out right they have no job prospects they have no no prospects of going to the costs are too high or they haven't jumped through the right hoops to go into uh, some kind of higher education or whatnot or academic education i won't say higher education because there's plenty of education to be had living life right uh, just in something else i've highlighted regarding the uh, subheader warlords are still around right the idea of skin in the game is woven into history historically all warlords and warmongers were warriors themselves and with a few curious exceptions societies were run by risk, take, risk takers 
not risk transfers. And that's one phrase that he uses, risk transfer, which is politicians now and corporations now, they transfer risk onto others, onto citizens, onto us, right? They are not held accountable, okay? And uh, that sort of plays on with uh, what I was mentioning regarding interventionists and stuff like this. Um, one thing he keeps on referring to is the Rubin trade. And the Rubin trade is basically, um, I think he was the head of Goldman Sachs or something like this. And basically it was just a scam, right? They knew they created a bubble in the early 2000s and they didn't let the cat out of the bag until they had their full positions buying them insurance, right? And then they let the, let the whole thing drop, right? with bank runs and stuff like this and and then they came out and said basically what the book black swan was about the two books before this i believe which came out in 2007 a year before everything went down the toilet regarding wall street right uh when basically a veil <laughs> was lifted and one realized oh my god they knew they were in a bubble they pulled the scam they sold all this bad debt to people as triple a and then they bought insurance to make sure they made a lot of money when they pulled the rug out when everybody pensions you know min tens of millions of people lost their pensions lost their jobs tremendous turmoil right and every, you know and then they gave money to the same people that did this thing and then those people put you know played the accounting game and they formed corporations put them on wall street and they start buying all this land and assets and stuff like this and have created another bubble the same this is a cycle that keeps on repeating right so this is what he has to say regarding bureau uh, bureaucracy bureaucracy is a construction by which a person is conveniently separated from the consequences of his or her actions right and one thing he does with the book is he's got sort of italic sort of embedded stuff here that sort of you could regard those as laws right his rules his stuff that stands out some stuff you know it's basically something we talked about in the video where we talked about how to read a textbook when things are highlighted by the author read them right even if you're speed reading read them slow down okay uh decent uh decentralization this is what his take is on decentralization Decentralization is based on the simple notion that it is easier for uh, macro bullshit than it is easier to macro bullshit than micro bullshit, right? So it's easier to bring up a big brush and make general statements all the time, right? Which is what our politicians do, just talking points, instead of focusing in and talking about the intricate, right? The micro. Right, so I'll read that again. Decentralization is based on the simple notion that it is easier to macro bullshit than micro bullshit. Decentralization reduces large structural asymmetries. So you can for now think about asymmetries as uh, uh, asymmetries as uh, people that don't have any skin in the game, right? People who make decisions and don't pay the consequences when things go crazy. Okay. Hello, Nix. How are you doing? Welcome to the stream and a recording session. Wow, we're an hour and we're <laughs> on page 13 of Nassim's book, right? And I'm skipping some of the highlight stuff I've been reading. Bankers. The master risk transfers. Oh yeah, let me read you this. I highlighted this. I'm reading these things, and if I like it, I'm gonna read you this thing. Okay. What is your thoughts on string theory? I like string theory. I like string theory. String theory. String theory. String theory. Elegant universe. Uh, this book is. Uh, have I read any other books on string theory? I might have read another book on string theory. I can't remember. But this is my quintessential book on string theory. This was, I knew about string theory, by the way, back in the 1980s. Uh, I knew someone that actually did some of the mathematics, got involved with some of the mathematics regarding string theory. So I got introduced, I've been reading little excerpts of string theory articles and stuff on string theory since the 1980s. But this is the book that I've read that was 
fantastic. Brian Greene's Elegant Universe. Highly recommend it. Uh, this thing came out in the late 1990s, I believe. Uh, I read it back in 2000, 2001 or so. Um, I'm just going to read another uh, index. One of my biggest pet peeves with Talib. He uses postmodern definitions of risk to describe pre modern cultural developments. Risk and insurance were, te were uh, technologies developed in the 17th century by Spanish mariners. The idea of risk as we understand it today simply did not exist uncertainty was a product of fortuna not a series of uh, potentialities potentialities uh, and con, 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 contingencies potentialities and contingencies so let me read that again the idea of risk as we understood it today simply did not exist uncertainty was a product of fortuna not a series of potentialities and contingencies so he's using uh, so index is saying that uh nasim is not really using risk in a proper definition and the origin of the word that it was used for uh, possibly i caught i've caught nasim saying a couple of things one of the lectures by the way there was a lecture that was put out by nasim just it just came out here let me find it it came out yesterday just coincidence um boop let me find it hey where is it yeah there it is so this lecture i'm just gonna uh, it was just put out uh november 8th yeah so that's yesterday on google talks right and it's worth watching right and in previously i've watched interviews with nasim and lectures with nasim and he mentions that he's more he's a writer he's not a lecturer so he's he jumps around he's chaotic right he's if he was a sitting in a classroom right now in a present current education system in canada the united states they call him they say he had severe add and they would give him a few pills to pop and say be quiet right thankfully he is not in our current education system right now right so he jumps around a lot it's a nice talk i like it uh, i sort of have those tendencies as well so i like it but just in in regards to what index says where nasim is not using the word risk in the true definition when it came out through the spaniards in the 17th century and stuff like this he's he's bringing us brush show he's making some of the mistakes he's referring to as well obviously but in that lecture he talks he puts out a sort of a image of a peacock right and then he mentions in a, in a silly kind of way he mentions that the big peacock tail is useless right now if you know animal history and stuff like this you know it's not because it it's used as you know attracting females and it's also used as protection defense mechanism you make yourself bigger with animals if you can make yourself bigger in nature if you ever if you ever get attacked by a bear uh, uh, a cougar or cougar tracking you you'll pay attention when you're in the woods a cougar just doesn't randomly attack you bears if they don't track humans right the only reason a bear would attack you in canada anyway was, i know this because i did geophysical work right the only reason that a bear will attack you is if you all of a sudden surprise them right or if you get between their cubs and the mother right the bear, bear will feel threatened and they will attack you okay uh, mountain lions cougars are different they'll hunt they'll hunt you they'll track you cats that's what they do so in the woods you make noise to let the bears know uh, that someone's there and you also keep an eye out in the woods in the periphery just to make sure a cougar is not tracking you right so if you're familiar with animals they have defense mechanisms stuff like this but in the lecture he mentions that the peacock tail is useless and then doing a q a this person gets up during google talk this person gets up he goes he asks him a question he challenges or he makes a statement more than anything with nasim and then he mentions to nasim by the way you mentioned that a peacock tail is useless as a 
evolution in biologists or something like this he mentions i want to make sure that people appreciate that a peacock tail is not useless right so he calls nasim on being too general just mentioning that a peacock tail is useless so that's along the same lines of what index was saying uh sorry about the long-winded <laughs> link there have you seen jpb 12 rules for life uh, jpb i don't know who jpb is i suck at his book that's not nice uh, no no that's okay it might not be his type of asmr that's okay um uh, uh, qc warrior okay uh he's allowed to say he doesn't like no nah, bro this guy's chilling me out okay good good we're working for some we're working for some they actually call him a pop academic act actually a term i hate his ideas are uh valuable but most scholars argue he could be a little more intellectually careful oh yeah he has a bone to pick with intellectuals as well with academics as well 100 uh, percent so i can see why academics would uh, uh would not like nasim i'd say i could take a, a bear in a fight Ooh. Uh, you don't want to take a bear in a fight the best thing to do is uh, make sure you never get in a fight with a bear not a good idea i would agree because he tends to ignore existing research to make his points yeah he does make you know i don't agree with everything nasim he's a great writer i like the ideas the seeds that he plants and the ideas that he throws you on right uh how is this as asmr it's just chill conversation about a book right an important book so let me read you this thing about bankers okay Uh, but but not to worry if we do not decentralize and distribute responsible uh, responsibility it will happen by itself the hard way a system that does not have a mechanism a mechanism of skin in the game with a build-up uh, in uh, with a build-up of imbalances will eventually blow up and self-repair that way if it survives right for instance bank blow-ups came in in 2008 because of the accumulation of hidden and asymmetric risks in the system bankers bankers masters of risk transfer okay that's his comment regarding the 2008 financial the scam hello visa super engaging writing style and interesting ideas though yeah love his writing style I haven't read too many books written in this way uh, and this is exactly the way I like like uh, to read these types of books right stuff that makes you pause and highlight and take notes and look things up right systems learn by removing right let me read you this as well because this is uh, this is uh, related to something that I learned when it came to writing when i was writing uh, when i got into writing i learned how to write right i didn't learn how to write in high school or university i learned how to write by blogging in the mid 2000s so it was early 30s where or mid -thir early mid 30s i guess when i started really put the time in for myself to learn how to write and something that a friend of mine told me that was uh, she was editing my work right she told me this she said chicho you know you're done editing your work when you don't have anything else to take out right so when you're writing and that's the way i i if i have the time i put into it when i'm writing usually and even editing video right when i'm editing my own work usually what i do i go through it enough times where i'm tired about tired of going through it right and if I can't find anything else that I can take out, then I know I'm done, I release it, okay? So this is what he says regarding, uh, again, subtitle, uh, systems learn by removing. So quote, now if you're going to highlight only one single section from this book, here is the one. The interventionist, interventionalista case 
is central to our story because it shows how absence of skin in the game has both ethical and epi epistemological effects related to knowledge right i had to look that up before but it's actually put it in brackets as well right epistemological related to knowledge we saw that interventionalists don't learn because they are not the victims of their mistakes and we hinted at with pathema mathemata right what we talked about which is guide your learning through pain okay the same mechanisms of transferring risk again he's highlighted this is his I, I he's put in italics right this the same mechanisms of transferring risk also impede learning right so if we're transferring risk to other people we're not learning right which is what happened in 2008 when Obama came to power and said we're not gonna look into what happened with the war crimes that were committed in Afghanistan Iraq torture around the globe with black sites and stuff like this we're not gonna look into that right nothing was learned the same mechanisms of transferring risk also impede learning right more practically you will never fully fully convince someone that he is wrong only real reality can okay actually to be precise reality doesn't care about winning arguments survival is what matters for again italics the curse of modernity is that we are increasingly populated by a class of people who are better at explaining than understanding right or better at explaining than doing so learning isn't quite what we teach inmates inside the high security prison called schools right i like this guy really i've mentioned this before when we're talking about education but so learning isn't quite what we teach inmates inside the high security prisons called schools which is the way i look at our present centralized education system right one of the hardest things i have to do when um just to let you know by the way when the, the, you know just going out and teaching mathematics and stuff like this and interacting with students and i interact with parents a lot because i do private i do group and private lessons and stuff like this either for people who want to learn the material really fast they want to get it over with and move on to whatever it is that they're doing and on the other extreme sense with people who have the system has completely failed right and they don't understand mathematics they don't understand physics and they need to get through this stuff right one of the hardest things i have to do when i'm teaching mathematics when i'm interacting with students and parents is this i have to turn to them and say listen i'm not here to defend our current education system right not even close i'm here to tell you that i regard our centralized education system to be complete garbage it's useless if anything it is by the youth by kids right now that have access to the internet that can on a click of a button find anything they want for them to be forced into buildings to sit into sitting in desks which are extremely uncomfortable bad for the body bad for the mind right for them to be forced to do this five days a week six to seven hours a day is equivalent to putting him in prison right you cannot expect them to react well to that right it's not a good place to learn it's not if anything it's a place to unlearn right so this sentence so learning isn't quite what we teach inmates inside the high security prisons called schools okay
Let me continue reading a couple more sentences. In biology, learning is something that, through the filter of intergenerational selection, gets imprinted at the cellular level. Skin in the game, I insist, is more filter than deterrence. Evolution can only happen if risk of extinction is present. Further, there is no evolution without skin in the game. So we don't learn without skin in the game. A couple other things he's mentioned here is uh, systems learn by removing parts via negative, neg negativa, right? So editing, you know you're done editing by if you don't have anything else to remove, right? Skin in the game keeps human hubris in check. Now we're in, uh, and everything we talked about so far, well, since prologue one, that was just part one, prologue, up to page uh, 15, right? And we're into the second part, prologue part two, a brief tour of cemetery, evolution of moral cemetery, see table one. Let me see where table one is. Yeah, this one. He's got a table on page 19, evolution of moral cemetery. Uh, and he goes through and he starts talking about um, some of the philosophies, some of the uh, some of the ways people introduced skin in the game or talked about symmetry, right? Talk about sort of holding people accountable, right? And it, for example, uh, in this table, in table one, page nineteen, okay. Uh, evolution of moral symmetry. Hammurabi Lex Talinus. Hammurabi, I had to look this up. It was a king. Uh, where was it? I had to look up a few things. So uh, I'm meshing up the different uh, people I looked up. But basically, he was a, a king or something during uh, ancient times, right? And he mentioned, this person came up with the law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? That was sort of the justice system that was prevalent, right? But some people take that literally. Nassim says, uh, you shouldn't take that literally, right? Because an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, then if a blind person kills someone else or takes out an eye, you can't remove an eye from a blind person, right? So there are imperfections in that mindset, in that law system, right? And then he has another column that says, 15th law of wholeness and justice, quotation mark. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? And this one is, uh, he's got the page numbers here, you know, what they're referencing, stuff like this. And he's got called, something called the silver rule. And I'll read you what the silver rule is. And he's got something called the golden rule. Golden rule says this, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? That's the golden rule. I didn't know about the silver rule. I like the silver rule better as does Nassim and he makes a very good point of why the silver rule is better, right? For, and then he's got the last column, he's got formula of the law, of the universal law. Act only in accordance with that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it will become a universal law. That's like grand scale, right? Let me read you the silver rule though, okay? Uh, just after I re read the index's comment here. In 1992, you look back, argue that moder modernity was developing into a risk society, unlike Talib. He argued that techno-ecological developments produce a global society that makes risk spreading or risk transference impossible. Ecological risk and ecological disaster become a shared experience. He sums it up well in his famous phrase, poverty is uh, hierarchic, smog is democratic. Haha, <laughs> that's cool. 
I can see where he's coming from, but I think uh, index for me, uh, risk transference is definitely there, but risk transference is there on a shorter term scale, I think, uh, which is one something that Nassim, I think, is uh, for me where he comes from because he's a trader or he used to be a trader, right? Uh, so for me, it sounds like what Yurek Beck is saying, I would agree with if he's talking longer term. Yeah, that's what I would think because whatever's happening, happening environmentally, whatever's happening technologically, whatever's happening to the water supply, to the air quality, to, to society in general, is going to affect all of humanity. But if people are selfish, right, and we have a lot of selfish, self-centered people in our society right now who are running things, pre-ordering society, and that seemed definitely overlaps with uh, Jonathan Nitsan, right? Uh, for those people, they only have a shorter time frame in mind, as far as um, I can tell, right? They're only thinking 10, 20, 30 years ahead, maybe 40 years ahead. They're not thinking 100 years ahead. So they don't care if that risk tolerance, if that damage, the repercussions of that is going to play out for them. They're either going to be dead and long gone, or they're going to use all their money that they're making off this disaster to buy their properties wherever they're buying their properties and live in their private cities. I think it concerns the severity of the risk. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that would that would make sense. Severity of the risk. For instance, a small market crash versus a 2008 crash, which affects everyone in the market or not. Um, I would say the 2008 crash didn't affect everyone. Uh, it affected some people very in a very positive manner. Those same scumbags that caused, caused the 2008 crash and the same scumbags that gave them safe safe harbor right and we know who those people are they made out like bandits the general public uh didn't the general public uh, got burnt hard right they threw a couple of people to the wolves right to just you know made examples of them one of them being uh geez throughout the last couple of decades martha stewart they they threw in jail like seriously <laughs> Martha Stewart yeah continue the stuff I so I'll definitely read that I'm curious uh, you look back um, so what are we talking about brief history of symmetry skin in the game style symmetry uh, risk transfers blow up of systems risk transfers blow up yeah Let's see, what are we doing? Wow, we're gonna have this for an hour and a half. We're in part two only. Let me see where I can find Ralph Nader. I got another point for Ralph Nader. Let me read the the other thing I've highlighted regarding Ralph Nader. Gold has one central thing. Is established symmetry between da, 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 da. Well, let me read this one too. No, no, let's just read the Laraf Nader. The well known uh, Ralph Nader will impose some penalty. Oh, no, this is connected to what we read before, I think. Okay, let me read you this because it sort of relates to what he's uh, Nassim is saying. I'm not that literal. More practically, some economists have been trying to blame me for warning of wanting to reverse the bankruptcy protection offered in modern times some even accuse me of wanting to bring back the uh, guillotine for bankers i am not that literal it is just a matter of inflicting some penalty just enough to make the bob rubin trade less attractive and protect the protect the public right so index this sort of connects up to what we're talking about he's not being that literal He's, he's, he's got Greek in him. He's Mediterranean in him, Lebanese in him, or he was born in Lebanon, I believe. But he's Greek. He's Greek, and he's lived in the United States. He's an American citizen, right? But he talks in extremes, right? But the Bob Rubin trade. Let me explain what the Bob Rubin trade is, or Black Swan, the 
two books before this. Basically, Black Swan, uh, Nassim is, uh, as he mentioned, he was he became a trader, and as a hobby, he got into mathematics and learned the mathematics and just took off on the mathematics and did a whole bunch of analysis. I don't know if I would consider him a mathematician. I really don't know, right, where he stands in academia, right? But one thing he did with the Black Swan, from just a summary of everything he's read and Ruben trade, he says our present system economic system political system is based on everything working out fine working out fine working out fine sort of like a gaussian normal distribution right and then in the tails there are extreme events that happen and they're rare right and the rubin trade is this the rubin trade is as soon as something happens on the extremes in the normal distribution right something happens you know a hundred year flood or a thousand year flood happens people like that work for bankers, central banks and stuff like this, or Goldman Sachs and large banks, right? What they do, they come out and say, oh, that was an extreme event. We couldn't predict it, right? And because they say we couldn't predict it, that was the markets doing this thing, or it was a star, you know, exploding a gazillion light years away, or asteroid going past the Earth or something like this. They say there's no way we could predict this, so we should be held liable for what took place, right? And that's what happened in 2008. Uh, Index is uh, just replying, a big enough crash affects even those who are not active participants in the market. It affects even those who try to isolate themselves from market effects through non-market linked assets. Where, whereas a simple trade gone wrong, Will not affect the broad. Oh, okay, cool. But you're absolutely right. Any market, fair or otherwise, creates opportunities at the expense of others. There will always be someone who benefits from others' misery. Yeah. And if there's a lot of people that are miserable, being miserable, and only few people benefiting from that misery, then power is becoming more and more centralized, right? Which is what we've been seeing taking place. Oh yeah, here's the golden rule and the silver rule. Okay, this I really like. I really highlighted this, right? Silver beats gold, and this is what he talks about. Da, da, da. We rapidly go through the rules to the right of Hammurabi. Levectius is a sweetening of Hammurabi's rule, the golden rule. The golden rule wants you, and I'm quoting here, so the golden rule wants you to treat others the way you would like them to treat you. The more robust silver rule says, do not treat others the way you would not like them to treat you. I love that. More robust? How? Why is the silver rule more robust? He is asking us questions, right? And then he gets into it. Quote, First, it tells you to mind your own business and not decide what is good for others. So let's read the golden rule and silver rule again. That way we know what this paragraph is talking about. Right? So the golden rule is this. Treat others the way you would like them to treat you. Silver rule says this. Do not treat others the way you would not like them to treat you. So golden rule says treat other people the way you want them to treat you. Silver rule says, don't treat others. Uh, don't treat others the way you don't want to be treated, right? Golden rule imposes. Silver rule says, hey, back off, right? Do not treat others the way you do not like to be treated. Right? To me, anyway, that's my interpretation. My understanding or the way i'm implementing it right first it tells you to mind your own so silver rule, rule is more robust than the golden rule reasons being this first it tells you to mind your own business and not decide what is good for others you know with much more clarity we know with much more clarity what is bad than what is good the silver rule can be seen as the negative golden rule 
and as I am shown by my uh, Calabrese and Calabrese speaking Barber it's Barber he's referring to a character he's come up with earlier okay Barber every three weeks via negativa acting by removing is more powerful and less error prone than via positiva acting by adding and this again connects up to what I mentioned what I understand regarding editing may it be editing your writing or editing my videos right I follow the rule as my friend recommended acting by removing right that's better than acting by adding right so the silver rule is acting by removing it's not adding right saying don't instead of do to a certain degree uh, and then he's got a little footnote on acting by adding and I'm going to read you the footnote as well scalable equals fractal that's what I've made a note myself Johnny Andrews is everyone asleep I'm not yet <laughs> but I'm definitely gonna chill after the stream okay so here's a footnote regarding acting by adding or the sentence that we read right Acting, so I'll read that again. Acting by removing is more powerful and less error prone than acting by adding. And the footnote is this Do not do unto others what you would not have them do unto you. I, Socrates, Heller, the Elder, something other name. What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. Right. So that's a quote from the Torah. Rabbi, or that's a quote from Rabbi Helila, the elder, drawing on Latvius 1918. Do nothing to others, which is, which if done to you, would cause you pain. This is the essence of morality. Right. So there are historically other disciplines that are saying the same thing as a silver rule right ah, thanks need need more Dor <laughs> Dor <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you're enjoying the stream man thank you and a great book and a nice book censorship I made a little look at all the highlights I got here censorship censorship let's read the stuff about censorship let me have a sip of actually I'm gonna pop a little muffin okay yeah Johnny a lot of life lessons a lot of things that you can implement right a way of being which is fantastic Sip it to you. It's a really nice sticky muffin. It's got blueberries and honey in it. Let's read censorship. And he's got a little thing on ethics. I'm gonna read you guys two paragraphs, okay? sentence in two paragraphs quote deal with weaker states as you think it appropriate for stronger states to deal with you nobody embodies the notion of symmetry better than Isocrates I Isocrates who lived more than a century and made significant contributions when he was in his uh, 90s he even managed and I don't know this person I gotta look this up he even managed a rare dynamic version 
of the golden rule. Conduct yourself towards your parents as you would have your children conduct themselves towards you. We had to wait for the great baseball coach Yogi Berra to get another such dy dynamic rule for symmetric relations. I go to other people's funerals so they come to mine. More effective, of course, is the reverse direction to treat one's children the way one wished to be treated by one's parents. Okay. The idea behind the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States is to establish a silver rule style symmetry. You can practice your freedom of religion so long as you allow me to practice mine. You have the right to contradict me so long as I have the right to contradict you. Effectively, there is no de democracy without such an un unconditional symmetry in the rights to express yourself and the gravest threat in the slippery slope in the attempts to limit speech on grounds that some of it may hurt someone's feelings. Such restrictions do not necessarily come from the state itself, rather from the forceful establishment of an intellectual monoculture by, by overactive thought police in the media and cultural life. That paragraph right there applies in our present world. This should be something that is written and plastered on walls, on billboards everywhere. Because right now, from what I'm seeing anyway, everybody is trying to censor everybody else, right? May it be platforms, may it be people, may it be groups, may it be schools, may it be theaters, may it be movie, film. It's crazy. It's crazy. People are self-censoring. I am myself self-censoring. I know one seller on eBay. Um, that I've caught, bought comic books from and he's a local seller right and when I buy books from him I go pick up the books from his store right and he used to leave comments that were funny hilarious and you know one of the comments would be uh, payment was faster than a monkey jumping off a of blah 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 something like this right a few months ago I went in and I showed you guys that comic book haul right a few months ago I went in and I was talking with him and uh, I said, hey, you changed your feedback on eBay. He goes, oh, I stopped using the word monkey. And I'm like, oh, why? I like it. it was funny. He goes, no, no, in these times, you can't use the word monkey. I don't I don't know what the repercussions of that going to be. And I was like, what? And then all of a sudden, I went, oh, wow. So self-censorship had, had, has reached a level where an eBay seller, which has got 100% positive feedback writing, is scared of using the word monkey in a feedback in a sentence that was very humorous and he would change it up a lot right and he mentioned that he calls his kids hey little monkey like <laughs> right so that's where it's playing out um but, but, but where is that little footnote i've highlighted the footnote but i can't find where the footnote is from but I'm gonna read you. Oh yeah, this is the so here's a little footnote that he had regarding uh, to treat one's children the way one wishes to be treated by one's parents. Right, that was one of the acronyms, and he had a little footnote on here. A stance against violation of symmetry appears in the parable of unforgiving servant in the New Testament, Matthew 12:21 to 31. A servant who has his huge debt waived by a compassionate lender subsequently punishes another servant who owed him a much smaller amount for most uh, commentators seem to miss that the true message is dynamic symmetry not forgiveness so i like that interpretation he's taken a sort of a message that's in the new testament showing that you should forgive that and stuff like this but he's 
reanalyzing that and saying that message is not about forgiveness that message is about symmetry if someone else has forgiven your debt then you should forgive down the line right which is fantastic i like it i like the way he's doing some of this stuff mm. here's another sentence i highlighted behave as if your action can be generalized to the behavior of everyone in all places under all conditions the actual text is more challenging da, 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 da. act only in accordance with the maxim through which you can at the same time will that it will become a universal law and that was from the table that we read right from evolution and moral symmetry in the previous table right? and i'll read that the rewording of that behave as if your action can be generalized to the behavior of everyone in all places under all conditions right which is okay and act in such a way that you treat humanity whether in your own person or in the person of any other never merely as a means to an end but always at the same time as an end wise words and i think that's uh, kant he's uh, quoting formulation kant as it gets uh, universal behavior is great on paper disastrous in practice okay so i'm going to read you a paragraph quoting or a couple of paragraphs maybe we'll see where it takes us okay why so he's asking a question universal behavior is great on paper disastrous in practice why as we will uh, belabor at nauseam nauseam in this book we are local and practical animals sensitive to scale the small is not the large the tangible is not the abstract the emotional is not the logical just as we argue that micro works better than macro it is best to avoid going to the very general when saying hello to your garage attendant we should focus on our immediate environment we need simple practical rules even worse the general and the abstract tend to attract self-righteous psychopaths similar to the interventionalists of part one of the prologue in other words Kant did not get the notion of scaling yet many of us are victims of Kant's universe universalism as we saw modernity likes the abstract over the practical uh, practical particular let me read that again as we saw modernity likes the abstract over the particular social injustice warriors have been accused of treating people as categories not individuals few outside of religion religion really got the notion of scaling before the great political thinker eleanor ostrom about whom it whom a bit in chapter one okay in fact the deep message of this book is is that the danger of universalism taken two or three steps too far conflating the mi micro and the macro likewise the crucifix of the idea of the black swan was uh, pla platonification missing central but hidden elements of a thing in the process of transforming it into an abstract construct then causing a blow up dangers of univer univer <laughs> universalism right so the dangers of universalism so he's basically saying things have to be uh, we have to everything is not scalable so there are situations where we have to treat a certain system only with local rules and those local rules cannot be extrapolated to universal rules from Kant to fat tony okay and fat tony is another character that he has that he talks about 
Ah, da, 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 da. What does Fat Tony say? In New Jersey, here, let us move uh, to the present, tr to the trans transactional, highly transactional present. In New Jersey, cemetery can simply mean, in Fat Tony's terms, don't give crap, don't, don't give crap, don't take crap, right? Don't give crap, don't take crap. His more practical approach is start by being nice to every person you meet. But if someone tries to exercise power over you, exercise power over them. Okay. Hello, Coyote 2. Chicho, Sleepy Waves, how are you doing? Welcome to another stream. Regulation risk, options trading, how are we doing for time? Oh wow, we're almost at two hours. We're almost at two hours. We're halfway through what I wanted to get done. We're on page 23, 22, 23 of a 47 page introduction part of this, right? Systems yet smart by elimination. What should we do? What should we do? We're from Kent. And I have so much more stuff highlighted here. What are we talking about today? We're talking about Nicholas Taleb's uh, Nicholas Taleb's Nassim Nicholas Taleb's skin in the game, right? We've been doing uh, some meetings, discussions, highlights. Uh, what should we do? As you can tell, my throats are getting a little raw reading this. <clears throat> of water ah, that felt great oh my pleasure index I think we're gonna call it a stream I think so so we got to page 22 23 thanks for being here index by the way and all the info fantastic fantastic and who was the person you mentioned should i scroll up where was he you look back you look back you've mentioned him before yeah i like that guy you look back actually i think i looked him up i'll look him up again sexual uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, looks like we're getting a horde of trolls coming in, maybe. I hope you guys are reading this. Better than trolling, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. This book will troll the crap out of you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you can take it. If you can take it. If you can take it. Okay. So, that's sort of the intro to this book half the intro anyway there's another 47 pages uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, because we're recording this and I think the sound is still going okay cool so I think what I'll end up doing is uh, we'll leave it there if you guys end up reading this book uh, I hope you give it a shot if you find anything that I've skipped over or I misinterpreted uh, let me know uh, we might come back and I might do another stream, continue from page 22. Uh, and most likely those streams, um, probably in a couple of days, I'm going to do another announcement of when the next streams are going to come up. Um, they're most likely going to be coming up on Wednesday, Thursday, maybe Thursday. But I might do a stream Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I might do three days back to back. Maybe we'll continue with this to read a little bit more. Uh, and I do have some ASMR math planned out to do. I want comic books planned out to do. Uh, I have some stuff related to our Raymond Feist Rift War Saga planned to do. We'll see if we can do it or not. Okay. Uh, beard, very massive. It's a good beard. Ah, that's what it means, maybe. Maybe. No, beard, very nice. I mean, no. What you reading? No. <laughs> you came late, brother. We've been going two hours on this. This is what we're reading. Highly recommended. Highly recommended. Okay. 
I provided links at the beginning of the stream to uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb's book, Skin in the Game. Challenging read, very good read, uh, very educational read. Aside from that, gang, thank you very much for being here. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope uh, you have many, many happy, happy hours of reading to do. Okay. I'll see you guys in the next stream and the next video. Bye for now.